We start our story in a small town right outside a big city, Benbrook, Texas, 17 miles southwest of downtown Fort Worth. It's safe, quiet, peaceful, the perfect example of stress-free country-style living. Most of the time, that is. But on Saturday, February 16th, 1974, it turned into a nightmare. What happened on that night is straight out of a terrifying urban legend story. As 17-year-old Carla Walker and her high school sweetheart sat in his car outside a popular bowling alley, she was suddenly ripped out of his arms. For 46 years, this was a cold case. In today's recap, you're gonna find out how the police finally cracked it. Good to see you. I'm Chris, and this is True Crime Recaps. Before we jump in, I just want to take a moment to thank today's sponsor. It's no secret how much fun Chris and I have with this game. And just the other night, we had a few friends over, opened a bottle of wine, and sprung this game on them too. And we had the best game night. It's not just about solving a murder. This game creates an ongoing narrative You'll learn about the backstories for each of the suspects, their complicated relationships to the victim, and watch a story unfold as you complete each episode or, you know, box. Hunt a Killer brings people together by challenging them to decode ciphers, examine clues, and solve puzzles. It's like an escape room delivered right to your door. When we unpack that box and discover what we had to work with, it is so cool. Right now, you can go to huntakiller.com slash TCR and use code TCR for 20% off your first box. Again, that's huntakiller.com slash TCR, and make sure to use code TCR for a 20% discount. Carla and her boyfriend Rodney were the quintessential high school couple in 1970s Texas. She was a junior and he was a senior at Western Hills High School. By all accounts, Carla was outgoing, athletic, and popular. She was a petite cheerleader, only a little over four feet tall, and Rodney was the star quarterback. On the night of February 16, 1974, they went to a Valentine's Day dance at school, then met up with some friends at a busy drive-in. Around midnight, Carla needed to use a bathroom, so Rodney drove her to the Ridgely Bowling Alley so she could use theirs. He walked her into the building and waited for her so they could walk back out to his car together. They were safely in the car for only a few minutes when a strange man suddenly opened up the passenger door and grabbed Carla. It all happened so fast, but here's what Rodney remembers about that night, decades later in this interview with WFAA News. He opened the door and she was falling out and I went to grab her and he started uh, beating me over the head back here with a uh, pistol. Said and done in just a matter of seconds. In an interview with Oxygen's The DNA of Murder with Paul Holes, referenced by MSN, he said the attacker also pointed a 22 at his face and pulled the trigger over and over, but it didn't go off. Carla was begging the stranger to stop hitting him and screaming for Rodney to get her dad. That's the last thing he heard before he lost consciousness. When he came to a few minutes later, he raced over to Carla's house. Her sister will never forget that night in this interview with NBC DFW. The doorbells just started ringing frantically in my parents' house. I mean, it was just banging, banging, banging. Blood just coming down his face, just screaming. They got her, they got her, they got her, they took her. So oh, I, I know she was terrified. I know she was terrified. Um, and for her to say, go get help, I'll go with you, don't hurt him, that was the kind of person she was. We just waited for her. We kept thinking, honestly, somebody would drive by in the middle of the night and push her out of the car. And, her father rushed back to the parking lot to help, but Carla was gone. The only evidence at the scene was a clip for a 22 caliber Ruger semi-automatic. It must have fallen out before the attacker opened the car door, which is probably the reason why Rodney is still alive. He remembered the guy was clean cut with short cropped wavy hair who talked with a Texas drawl and stood about 5 feet 11 inches wearing a shiny green sleeveless vest and a near white cowboy hat, according to articles quoted on heavy.com. Three days later, two Fort Worth police officers were searching for her body. It was a little cold that day, so they took turns getting out of the car to look in the storm culverts under some roads and bridges. 
They finally found her off a farm road near Benbrook Lake. The officer who saw her first said, "I looked over the edge, and sure enough, she was in there in a light blue dress." The same dress she was wearing when she was taken. According to the autopsy, she was beaten, assaulted, and tortured for two days before he strangled the life out of her. One other bizarre fact came up in the talk screen report: Carla tested positive for morphine. Now that clue refocused their attention toward suspects with medical or vet training or medical adjacent. They also collected DNA from her dress and body, but in 1974, the technology they needed to use it to catch her attacker was decades away. And they had one more clue: a piece of possible evidence they didn't even tell Carla's family until about 2019. Soon after Carla's body was discovered, an anonymous handwritten letter was sent to the detective in charge of the case. Take a look. It starts with a redacted word or phrase that could possibly be a name, and then it says K I L D Carla Walker in Benbrook. Sign ten one hundred. P S. It is hard to say, but it is true. Then again, it says sign ten one hundred. What could it mean? Well, here are a few theories. Ten dash one hundred is police code for a body. It's also trucker CB radio code for a bathroom break. Remember, Carla used the bathroom in the bowling alley before she was grabbed. Police decided to release the letter after 45 years as a last-ditch effort to track down the author. Their decision to revive the search for her attacker was also in large part thanks to the success of the Gone Cold podcast, who made this case the subject of their first season and brought it back into the mainstream. For decades before that, there were no developments in this case. Well. Almost none. One man actually confessed to this crime. In the late 1970s, a guy by the name of Jimmy Dean Sasser said he did it. He was indicted for it, but then later he recanted. This is him walking out of prison, explaining why he confessed. Published by KXAS TV. How did you come to pick Carla Walker's case, Jimmy? Well, I don't know really. I just got out of the clear blue sky. I just you know made the story up. I don't really know. Is it true you led the investigators to the culvert where her body was found? Yes, sir. That is true. How did you have that kind of knowledge? Well, it was shown to me a couple of years ago when I was out with a friend of mine drinking. He showed me, said he thought that that was the spot where she was found lying dead, and I just took it up from there. You see, the whole thing's embarrassing to me. It's just I really don't know what to say. You think that the whole thing has changed your life for the better here? Yes, sir. It sure has. You may not believe this, but since I've been in jail, I've changed my life. I've turned my life over to God, and He's going to help me from a drunk. I'm just going to change altogether. Then, in September 2020, they caught a break, a big one. The DNA evidence they were able to salvage from Carla's dress and bra went to a private lab specializing in testing old or hard to work with genetic evidence. Before this, they weren't able to get a full profile from standard DNA testing, and the new technology worked. For the first time, detectives had a genetic profile of a suspect to work with, and it led them to 77-year-old Glenn Samuel McCurley. As it turned out, he was no stranger to this case. He had been questioned two months after her disappearance in 1974. Now, remember that .22 Ruger magazine they found at the scene? Glenn owned the weapon that matched it. Back then, he told detectives his wife had gone to West Texas to visit family, and his .22 had been stolen six weeks earlier, right around the time Carla was taken. He said he didn't report it because he was an ex-con who had been to jail for stealing cars 12 years earlier. He claimed he was working that day and had no idea who Carla was. And guess what he did for a living? He was a truck driver. But without hard evidence linking him to Carla, he walked away. Two months before his arrest in September 2020, investigators went through his trash to find DNA to test against the 1974 sample. On September 4th, 2020, they got the confirmation they needed. Glenn McCurley was their man. Six days later, they interviewed Glenn and his wife at home. He gave them the same story he had in 1974, and he agreed to give them a DNA sample. It was a match to DNA found on Carla's bra. He was definitely the guy, and he was arrested. So, who is this person? Detectives with the Fort Worth Police Department answered that question briefly at a press conference about his arrest.、Uh, he's been 
working uh, here locally and uh, just living a very normal life and married and two children and just going about his, his life. A neighbor called him a God-fearing, church-going man, according to the Star-Telegram. The article offered a few more details about him. Apparently, he was accused of stealing a 1955 Pontiac from Henson Bowling Lanes in Abilene, Texas, and another car from Colorado City. He was arrested after a police chase and spent some time in Huntsville Unit Prison before he got out on parole in April 1961. In 1988, his son was hit by a drunk driver. At the time of Carla's attack, he would have been about 10 years old. In a prison interview with KRLD, Glenn said he'd been driving around parking and drinking on the night she was abducted. One of the places he said he pulled over to drink beer was the parking lot of the Ridgely Bowling Alley. That's where he claimed he saw Rodney screaming at Carla in the car. He says he went over, opened the door, and knocked him off of her. Then he pulled her over to his car, where they talked for a while while she calmed down. He claims she thanked him for getting her away from her boyfriend. Then he said, she just gave me a hug. I gave her a kiss. I mistook her for something else. I didn't mean to do it. But he did say this to detectives. I'm as good as gone if I tell you what I did that night. He even hinted that he would try to hurt himself if he was found guilty, according to MSN. Police said they did get a confession out of him, but the details of what he said haven't been released. He was indicted for this crime, but when or if he might be going to trial and what his plea might be is unclear right now. And that's your recap. Thank you so much for watching. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, please subscribe and give this a like. It only takes a second, but it means the world to us. Amy and I are back here on Wednesday for the podcast with two recaps, and we'll see you back here next Sunday for another True Crime Recap. Take care.